Hey there, I'm Mark in affiliation with Spectrum Pulse and we're starting a new billboard year with Rod Wave and Glorilla and this it's Billboard Breakdown. Well, it doesn't look like any shenanigans are afoot, so welcome one and all to the 11th season of Billboard Breakdown. Yes, for some ungodly reason, a new Billboard year for 2025 has started, because Billboard, as a record-keeping magazine going back to the 1950s, has decided to synchronize with their award show, which not only does nobody care about, but also puts a massive asterisk around what is considered a calendar yearly representative sample, and then undermine their historic reputation not saying much and I can't even say it'll drive a lot of traffic given that by this year in the virtue of the cutoff it undercuts the pop stand pipeline that they want for the traffic now billboard has done many misguided or outright stupid things plenty of times before but when you think in an era where credibility is really hard to come by you would ensure all this was sacrosanct maybe add a couple of tracking weeks to a year in order to compensate for falling off and not defer to your events planning division now as it is I'm I'm going to be personally relying on a billboard cutoff date closer to the end of November for my own personal list to keep continuity. If billboard refuses to keep good records, I'm going to rely on those who actually can. But in the meantime, for 2025 and the remaining 10 publication weeks of 2024 that will count into it, we got something of a busy week here anyway. Although if you're looking at our top 10, you would not notice it. Because for another week, a bar song tipsy by Shabuzi has held the number one. And there hasn't been that much in the way of credible competition, although the margins have gotten a bit closer. Yeah, it held the top spot on streaming, it actually gained the top spot on sales, but the radio margin was in free fall all week. It is slightly more vulnerable. Now, Birds of Feather by Billie Eilish did make some gains on streaming, but the radio growth is just too slow, and honestly, the margin's too wide. I don't see it making up enough ground, especially when their sales are kind of limited. An Espresso by Sabrina Carpenter at number three isn't doing much better. It has better radio, but it may have hit its peak there and the streaming is falling off. And sure, that could open a door for Die With A Smile by Lady Gaga and Bruno Mars, currently at number four, but that actually lost a step on streaming and the radio push has been sporadic to say the least. It's got a lot of ground to make up there. Then we have I Had Some Help by Post Malone featuring Morgan Wallen at number five. I mean, it had a good week on streaming even though radio's in free fall. And that takes us to the bizarre position pickup for Lose Control by Teddy Swims up to number six. I mean, it had a rough week on the radio but saw just enough streaming gains despite losing position that it actually held up over Good Luck Babe by Chaperone at number seven despite her own losses across the board. And that's also a similar case for Taste by Sabrina Carpenter, which saw streaming losses and her radio is just not holding up and filling the gap. So naturally, that meant Beautiful Things by Benson Boone is back up to number nine because he's seeing a bizarre second wind on the radio and sales in order to beat back his own streaming losses. And that even got over Please 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 by Sabrina Carpenter at number 10 because she got just edged out on the radio and handily beaten on sales despite actually having better streaming. Now that naturally takes us to our losers and our dropouts. And here's the funny thing about the latter group is that after previous album bombs the past month or so, the biggest losses didn't really materialize higher on the charts. Yes, Love You, Miss You, Mean It by Luke Bryan was swept away rather quickly, along with Slow It Down by Benson Boone and Shihiro by Billie Eilish. But get lower and you'll see songs that never really got that far, like Niel by Fuerza Regida, Casual by Chapel Roan, The Emptiness Machine by Linkin Park, and Belong Together by Mark Amber, and at least Chevrolet by Dustin Lynch and Jelly Roll. It's finally gone. But as expected on an album bomb week, we actually have a lot of losers here, predominantly in the lower half of the charts. So, okay, let's start off with Post Malone and Pour Me a Drink with Blake Sheldon down at 40, and Guy for That with Luke Combs at 73. Then we have Dancing in the Flames with The Weeknd failing to launch at 52, Wind Up Missing You by Tucker Wetmore losing all the gains down to 56, 28 by Zach Bryan down to 59, and a swath of regional Mexican losses with La Patrulla with Peza Pluma and Nenton Vega at 60, and Dos Diaz by Peza Pluma and Tito Double P at 68, with the latter also seeing El 
Le Coron fell down to 91. Then we got a couple Sabrina Carpenter losses with Juno at 61 and Good Graces at 70. Mamushi by Megan Thee Stallion featuring Yuki Chiba's at 66. Beautiful as You by Thomas Retz at 67. Diet Pepsi by Addison Rae's at 72. Nights Like This by Kid Leroy's at 76. And Whiskey Whiskey by Moneybag Yo featuring Morgan Wallen at 77. Finally, Big Dogs by Hanumankind and Call Me hit 78. Houdini by Eminem hit 79. Think I'm in Love With You by Chris Stapleton featuring Dua Lipa at 80. I Never Lie by Zach Top slipped down to 81. Prove It by 21 Savage and Summer Walker at 83. Red Wine Supernova by Chapel Roan at 84. Am I Okay by Megan Maroney at 86. Residuals by Chris Brown at 88. And Lil Demon by Future at 97. Now for our returns and gains, well, really just gains. We actually didn't get any returns this week, and we had chalked nearly all of this up to album performance, either in this week or presuming the weeks to come. I mean, accepting Thick of It by KSI featuring Trippy Red actually gaining off the debut to 64. Please let this be a fluke thanks to the YouTube hate watches. Again, you should all know better. And I Love You, I'm Sorry by Gracie Abrams getting a streaming boost to 19. We got album impact that's building momentum, like for Liar by Jelly Roll at 74. And Apple by Charlie XCX at 62. I would put money on both of them seeing album bomb like behavior next week. But for this week, our biggest boost came from both Rod Wave and Glorilla, with the former getting Passport Junkie to 51 and Fall Fast and Love to 49, and the latter seeing TGIF at 22 and Hold On up big to 48. Unfortunately, Glorilla did not get a full album bomb this week, and honestly, not enough of her best songs from that project crossed over in the meantime. And that means we just have to handle Rod Wave, and we are in big album album bomb territory, so we're just focusing on best, worst, and those in the top 20. Outside of those, Karma at 100, Scared Love at 96, Dare at 95, Mike at 94, Waited Too Late at 93, Lost in Love at 87, cool drums on that one though, Even Love at 82, The Best at 75, Apply Pressure at 63, Turtle Race at 57, Nevermind at 54, Angel with an Attitude at 46, and Last Lap at 35, the title track. Real close to the honorable mention on that song. I really like it. But okay, that thankfully makes this a little bit more reasonable, albeit still rather busy. But we're gonna start off with number 99, Leave Me Alone by Big X The Plug. Man, shut the fuck up. I just want all you people to leave me alone. Hey, Big X, man, I need me a feature. Hey, Big X, can you get on this song? Hey, Big X, man, I ain't even got it. Where was you when I did all this shit on my own? Huh. I guess another story that's gone under-discussed here is that smaller breakthrough for Big X The Plug this week off of his new project called Take Care. Okay, ambitious title, I'll give him that. And honestly, it sounds really promising. I don't love the chalky trap skitters here, but between the dark operatic intro that leads into the driving piano against the distant wails of guitar, give the production a sour, angry edge that works for this sort of more money, more problem song, where Big X The Plug just kind of wants to be left alone from all the out chasers and those who question how much he will live up to his rhymes, of which I'm certainly sympathetic. Most of those people should not be listened to. Although while I like his flow, and on some level I can respect the antisocial vibes, especially towards those who wouldn't say anything when he was at the very bottom, when he starts immediately complaining about his baby mom as the opening lines of the first verse, it feels like a weaker choice on the track. As a whole, I like this, but I'm not sure it's going to stick around, but not about to complain one way or the other. It's fine. Number 98, Mantra by Jenny. Pretty girls don't do drama unless we won. It'll be depending on a day. Pretty girls picking a defender. No, I'm a defender. Never let it catch no strip. This that pretty girl mantra. She's that stun. I'll make you want to swing both ways. Okay, I've said my piece about those attempting to go solo from Blackpink. Up until now, Jenny has not impressed me in the meantime. And when it comes to more self-aggrandizing flexes, I know the formula. I didn't have expectations. So yeah, color me stunned that I actually think this is really damn good. Maybe it's just how well balanced that bass line is alongside the ethereal swells on the second verse, alongside the flashes of horns that come through on the hook. The more textured percussion around that groove, you know what, it's got the feel of a flashier mid 2000 dance pop song that would have been produced by someone like Timbaland, except here by El Guincho, who gives Jenny the sort of solid foundational relic that Rosalia saw circa Motomami. Honestly, the production and flow of the song is so damn strong, I really like the hook, and it almost makes you ignore how Jenny isn't much of a vocal presence on the song, or how the lyrics are largely built for the slick, capricious LA girl power flex and little else. If we're looking for something that kind of fits into the 
through line of albums like Brat this year, I would say it's this song. And honestly, it's so well constructed and apt to that era, I think that makes sense. So yeah, legit great pop song, complete shock to me here. I like this a lot. If you haven't heard it, check it out. Number 92, I Love Her by Glorilla and T-Pain. Gotta tell everybody, I don't wanna keep it on the low. Goddamn, I love her. Uh, I love her. Goddamn, I love her. I love her. Whereas this was not a shock at all, or rather the shocking reminder that we didn't have to let T-Pain slip out of popularity, especially when it comes to delivering a nice big hook. Now, of my favorite songs on Glorious, this is probably the one I like the least. It's still great, but it's no Don't Deserve with Money Long, which should have absolutely charted. But I still really appreciate how lovestruck and bombastic T-Pain is against the flashy sense in the pianos. And when the fizzy trap knock comes in for Glorilla, it's really well produced, and it fits her vibe effectively. Especially as she seems genuinely surprised how much this is actually working for her despite all the bluster. And I like how cautious she is in letting her wall down, enjoying the good sex and hoping against hope that she doesn't regret it if she sees a real future with this guy. Honestly, one of the reasons I really like Glorilla so much is her ability to balance out all the brash attitude with an empathetic and self-aware sincerity that probably goes overlooked, and I think this is a really strong example. But on the flip side, number 90, How I Look by Glorilla and Megan Thee Stallion. Can't get next to me. How I look, checking for a nigga. That don't check for me How I look Not been on myself No recipe yeah, okay, not a lot to say with this one. Glorilla and Meg have already proven to be a great tag team this year, and this might be even better, even with that cheap trap percussion knock against some of that bells and the eerie tinkle of piano that builds in that pulse-pounding bass line that completely kicks ass. And yeah, the hot girl fight song is nothing new coming from either of these two, but I like how Glorilla's blunt edge is a really nice contrast to Meg's fiery side, where it's impossible not to hear some of the bars thrown in Nicki Minaj's direction, with the how I look being both the flex and the rhetorical question that serves as the perpetual eye roll to many of the cheap shots being thrown in their direction. But moreover, I think I am most impressed here with the chemistry. They trade off bars really well, they complement each other's energy, and if the song actually got a third verse or the right remix, this could easily become one of the best cuts that they have released to date, solo or otherwise. So yeah, kick ass. Excellent song. Number 89, Change Me by Big X the Plug. Okay, you know what, maybe this isn't fair to Big X The Plug, but what really caught more of my attention on this song was that uncredited soulful hook from Tony Coles, alongside the 70s Laura Lee sample flip with the slight touches of guitar around the horns and that rush of flutes. When they stacked the vocals on the hook as the bass pulled up alongside for the more textured trap percussion, I was all the way on board. Now, kind of a shame that I don't quite think Big X The Plug can really match some of that swagger and especially match that energy. He's got bravado in this new film success and I like his vocal tone, most of it have to come without having to change too much, but once you get past his solid flow, he's not exactly saying much beyond asserting that yeah, he's on top. The wordplay feels a bit bare bones. I mean, it's not bad by any means. The production, hook, vibe, they're doing a lot of heavy lifting. This would get more acclaim in a weaker week. But as it is with the other Big S The Plug song, I think I'm looking for a little bit more in the content to properly go over the top, and thus while it's good, maybe just not quite great. Number 50, Fuck Fame by Rod Wave featuring Lil Yachty and Lil Baby. Alright, so I'm not going to review Last Lap as an album on my main channel. I don't really think there's a point when it comes with Rod Wave these days. He's got his very well-trod subject matter and sound, and the lack of evolution in song structure and occasionally the production can be very frustrating. That said, he did attempt a couple experiments outside of that sound on the album, 
and this is one of the first and not exactly a good one. Maybe it's because the vocal mix and weedy guitar feels very mushy against the painfully thin percussion, or we're starting off with Lil Yachty attempting Rod Wave's soulful introspection on his come up and he's got nowhere near the vocal presence to pull it off, or because his petulant fuck fame message because he's so confident in his own lane, it might mean a little more if he didn't spend about a month crashing out online for all manner of reasons. I tend to blame the Drake affiliation. I blame that for a lot of things. But then there's Rod Wave's verse, which really isn't on the topic of fuck fame at all, given all the flexing and drug abuse where he's seeking out that numbness, especially given the loss of his uncle to suicide. I mean, the angst is tangible, but it doesn't match with any of the setup from Yachty, and Lil Baby doesn't do anything to pay it off in his stock flexing verse, and I guess seeking out more numbness too. He might honestly have the best verse in terms of flow and consistency, but again, it's not adding up up to more. Look, I'm not against the idea or framing and looking for numbness to cope with the stresses, even if it comes from fame, but it never feels like they go deeply enough for me to really buy it, especially when Rod Wave has hit that note over and over again across a number of albums. So yeah, mediocre at best, but you want to know what's actually worse? Number 44, Federal Nightmares by Rod Wave. Oh dear. Let me start by saying that I kind of get why Rod Wave wanted to make a more gangsta flexing song, especially if there are cases legally swirling around him. Although that kind of flies in the face of what he was saying on the opener Turtle Race, trying to stay legit, but whatever. And getting DJ drama for an overmixed Southern crunk throwback. It's not a bad idea. The problem is that the execution's a disaster. The trap snares clash with the squealing, cheap-sounding synths, and while the bass is well-miked, it's also chirpy and shrill. It reminds me of T.I. in the late 2000s in a bad way, except Rod Wave is bringing nowhere close to the power in order to sell it vocally. Yes, opening up the song by saying Barack Obama, that's hilarious, but it's wildly inconsistent with how serious Rod Wave is talking about his dead cousin and the family members in jail and a lot of palpable fear of police trying to crack down even if he won't snitch. So you'd also think by his second verse he wouldn't be threatening others who are trying to press the block. Especially if he's trying to make a billion like Jay-Z. It feels like there are mixed messages here. Look, the entire song is just a clusterfuck of mismatch ideas. And that's really unfortunate because it's actually one of the few Rod Wave songs on the album with some structure versus a real hook. It's just an experiment that went way sour. Honestly, kind of a shame. Number 36, Sympathy is a Knife by Charlie XCX featuring Ariana Grande. Okay, so Sympathy is a Knife is one of my favorite songs from Brat. The gurgling stabs a melody alongside the sharper percussion that ramps into the warping bombast of the hook, it goes off. And when you contextualize that it's probably directly targeting Charlie's own paralyzing fear towards Taylor Swift and how her world conquering celebrity can just warp the atmosphere of a scene, especially when Charlie XCX's boyfriend, George Daniel, is in the same group as Taylor Swift's now ex, Matty Healy, the 1975. Now, do I think there's a bit of beef and a petty streak here, given that Taylor Swift once brought Charlie XCX on the Reputation Tour, didn't exactly go well, that played out in the press at the time, and then Taylor Swift maybe played the reissue game to block Brat from going to number one this year. Well, uh, yeah, I believe it. It's catty from all sides, and neither artists are framing themselves as fully in the right in 2024. Makes for interesting energy. Almost had me wishing that Taylor Swift showed up on this remix, similar to how Lord did for Girls So Confusing. Instead, we got Ariana Grande, and then Charlie XCX opens up the song saying, It's all love with Taylor, and all of what I just said and can hypothesize was apparently wrong from her point of view, and the song is now directed at the press who is looking to take them down, even though her statements weren't a misquote back in the Reputation era, maybe just placed out of context. So I guess there's no surprise that Ariana Grande is here, given the context of Eternal Sunshine, but I'm of a few minds here. I get how bad tabloid energy can make social media a living hell, 
I was more sympathetic to Ariana Grande's messy situation than most. Go back to my old review. And online stands can really over-exaggerate their projections. But then I consider the actual art in question, where Sympathy is a Knife was more about Charlie's insecurity rather than direct pot shots being taken at Taylor. And I find it notable in the remix, all that old context and energy and really contrast is gone. And the song's nowhere near as good. The synths have been flattened into buzzy chunks against the rattling clip snares. The vocal interplay is messy in a way it really shouldn't be with Ariana Grande. And there's nothing close to the same bombast until this choppy attempt at a crescendo that becomes this metallic hyperpop mess on the outro. And thus I'm left with a track that really only works depending on how much you buy into Charlie XCX or how much you still care about any celebrity tabloid drama. But we're still at flies in the face of the themes, the messy ambiguity of Brat, and the callbacks to the messy, glamour tabloid era of the 2000s. This kind of feels like millennial damage control, it's just nowhere near as interesting. I reckon I spin when I hear it, be it a knife or not. Shame this is nowhere near as good. Number 31, What You Know About Me by Glorilla and Sexy Red. It honestly breaks my heart a little that of the new debuts from Glorilla, the biggest came with Sexy Red and the persistent reminder that we don't need her to really stick around. But honestly, this track feels like a pileup of choices that just seem to annoy me. Another crunk throwback with a buzzy nothing of a synth filling in for melody around the bells and reverb and cheap sounding percussion, probably a factor of that webby sample, and how much Sexy Red kind of nails his flatly obnoxious delivery in a throwback we didn't need, and where Glorilla kind of nails the simplified flow and yelping ad-libs, but she defaults to a spelling gimmick that feels really tacky, lacking humor, I didn't like it nearly 20 years ago. And correct me if I'm wrong, isn't part of Sexy Red's appeal that she's so over-the-top raunchy that we overlook the sloppy delivery and weak flow? Yes, her verse feels painfully undercooked. Thank God Glorilla swung back for the third verse, threw in a nice haymaker at JT with a tighter flow. She basically saves the song. And yeah, sure, it's not the worst track from the album when that Boss Mandilo collab exists, but Glorilla proved that she could do a lot more with better artists than waste a lot of time extending Sexy Red's 15 minutes. I prefer she give them to like Lotto or something. So yeah, even if I think it might probably stick around, I would skip this. And finally, number 16, 25 by Rod Wave. Till the I got your back, was I wrong for that shit? Tell me, is we too grown for that shit? I wanna lock it in, baby, no way in my options. Wanna travel, see the world, getting drunk on the island. Wanna settle, start a family, so tell me about it. And you so perfect, baby, don't get nobody that buys You know, it was gonna be really sad if Rod Wave couldn't deliver at least something good this week. And I guess we're very fortunate that it comes with his highest charting song here, which isn't far removed move from his usual formula either, but it's a really refined version of it. I really like that chime-like piano line around the echoing snap percussion that picks up a deeper impact as Rod Wade professes his love for this girl as the breathy female backing vocals echo around him. And what I like about the track are the finer details. He sounds world-weary, sick of playing the modern dating pool, and there's certain hedonistic pleasures and angsty wallows that aren't really satisfying him anymore. The novelty's gone. Why not attempt to embrace something a bit more real, settle down as he gets older. Now, I'm probably not going to place this among his absolute best. There's still no hook on the song beyond the one extended verse, and the flow gets a little frayed and sloppy at the end. But hey, look, I'm all for Rod Wave growing up and maturing. Really wish there was more of it on the album proper beyond this, but I appreciate what we got. Really good song. It's worth a shot. And yeah, that was our week. Honestly, a pretty good one, and at least at the bottom it falls out fast, with Federal Nightmares by Rod Wave as the worst of the week, with Fuck Fame with Lil Yachty and Lil Baby as a dishonorable mention. And y'all have no clue how close that Sympathy as a Knife remix was to tying for that lower spot. Especially when we go to the best of the week, we actually do have a tie. How I Look by Glorilla and Megan Thee Stallion, alongside Mantra by Jenny. Easily one of the biggest surprises for a K-pop, now scrap that, a pop song that I have heard in a long time, with I Love Her by Glorilla and T-Pain as the honorable mention. Next week, I am expecting another set of album bombs, probably going between Charlie XCX and Jelly Roll, we'll have to see. Certainly starting off this year busy, but until then, I'm Mark, you're watching Billboard Breakdown, affiliated with Spectrum Pulse. And I'll see you next time.